My name is David Miller and I'm a descendant, a proud descendant of the Gungaloo people of Central Queensland, west of Rockhampton. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners whose land we are standing. The land also has the university on our land. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Turrbal people north side of the Brisbane River, Yagra people south side of the Brisbane River, Gwandamooka people of Stradbroke Island, got the Gubby Gubby people of the Sunshine Coast, and not forgetting our people, Sherberg people, Waka Waka people. As I said, I'd like to pay my respects to my elders, past, present, and emerging. As we gather today in this sacred land, let us acknowledge that we are standing on country for which the elders and our ancestors have been custodians for thousands of years and on which have performed age ceremonies and celebrations. God of the dreaming, great creative spirit, from the dream time you have given your children the good things of this earth, from the dense forests that cover the hills where the sun goes down in the evenings to the whirling waters of Wollongabba, the swampy lands and waterholes to the east, the local creeks along the tracks, to the mangroves along the Brisbane River. We acknowledge our living culture and unique role in the life of this country. May the spirit of this place bless us and keep us on a good path and walk with us in recognition, respect, restoration, and reconciliation. And I may just add, may we walk softly, humbly, and respectfully on our sacred land. And while I'm here, can we also thank Eric, the Didge player. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, Uncle David and Eric. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathered today, the Turrbal peoples, and pay my respect to the elders past and present and to the young people, our future generation. I'd also like to thank the elders um, for sharing their wisdom, strength, resilience, stories, art, and caring for country and I'd like to acknowledge all First Nations people who are gathered with us today. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to start with some housekeeping. In um, an un unlikely event of an emergency, um, make your way to the emergency exit steps to evacuation area, which is located at the front in that, in that middle part, I think is correct. Um, the exit stairway for emergency is located to the right of the lift set, um, out here to the right of the lifts. Uh, the restrooms are located to just down the little hallway down there. Um, so today we have Tony Robinson and um, Kai, is it Kai? Mm -hmm. Taking Jayden. some Jaden, Jaden. Well, that's not. <coughs> I was given Kai um, uh, photos and videoing for social media. If anyone doesn't want to be photographed or videoed, uh, please reach out to me or Nanette or 
Eric or someone here for, um, to let us know. Um, down the back we have some great stores, so be sure to have a yarn and check out their items. Um, today we're honoured to have Archbishop Mark Coleridge joining us to provide a vote of thanks. We've received a, an apology from Bishop Tim Norton, who is unable to join us today. I'd like to acknowledge Arnie Jean Phillips, Christian Leader, Jane C. Olin, Director of First, for First Peoples ACU, Susan Dam, Dan, Campus Dean for ACU, and Ravina Waldron from Murray Ministry. In acknowledging and, and the partnership between ACU and the Archdiocese of Brisbane, we greatly appreciate, appreciative of the continued support and sponsorship by ACU, including hosting us all here today. Therefore, can I please invite forward Jane C. Olin, Director of First Peoples, to provide a brief welcome to ACU. Thank you, Jane. Good morning, friends and colleagues. Uh, I also acknowledge the traditional owners, custodians of the country where we're meeting this morning, the Turubil and Yagaro peoples, and I honour all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, in this room this morning, and it's wonderful to see so many uh, faces from uh, past and um, new faces as well. Uh, I'm not from this area. I can't welcome you to country. Uh, my cultural connection is with North Queensland, uh, Irukandji mob, one of the four uh, language-speaking groups of the Jabagai Nation. Um, this morning I'm honoured to welcome you, though, to ACU campus. Those of you who may not know, prior to this being a uh, university site, it was a theological college, and prior to that it was farming community. And prior to that, that always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, it was a meeting place, a gathering place for groups from all over Queensland. Um, it was a place, continues to be a place of learning, a place of learning culture, law, um, education. So we're very proud to have you here uh, uh, at our campus this morning on uh, Turubal and Yatra countries. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. <clears throat> the theme for this year's Laurel Blow Speaker Series is rest Restless Dream, Truth Telling. And today we have the privilege of listening to a conversation of truth telling between Rabina Rowe Colby Anderson and Uncle Bob Weatherall, who will be speaking on the repatriation of sacred Aboriginal ancestral remains and cultural property. The Laurel Blows sessions have come about through a RAP initiative to provide ongoing truth-telling and personal history through engagement of First Nations peoples to share their story, journey and cultural knowledge in a safe and welcoming space. The Laurel Blow Speaker Series is named after the late Butchula Nation, Gagari, Fraser Island woman, Laurel Blow, who was the first Aboriginal Archdiocesan employee who had significant influence on the Catholic Church in recognition, respect and delivering services to First Nations peoples in South East Queensland. We welcome today Ani Rabina Ni Ro Anderson, who will facilitate a conversation with Uncle Bob Weatherall to share his dedication to raising awareness of the history of stealing Indigenous peoples' relations that have gone on since contact with Europeans and his long battle to returning ancestors of this ancient land who were traded across the globe and boxed up as objects objects in museums back to their country. Following the discussion, Rabina will also facilitate a question opportunity with Uncle Bob, so please keep this in mind for your questions. At the conclusion of today's event, 
there will be light refreshments provided and time to mingle and check out the displays and stalls. I will now like to invite Ravina to come forward and introduce Ani Ravina and Uncle Bob. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming along today and taking part in this and to listen to the, the truth here um, of our skeletal remains. And I've had the privilege of knowing Uncle Bob for around 40 years, um, and he was actually the one that got me involved with FERA, the Foundation for Aboriginal Islander Research. Um, it was for his knowledge, his wisdom, and his strong presence culturally here in southeast Queensland, and, and always being at the forefront um, of our gatherings down at Musgrave Park um, and down at Jagger Arts Hall, but always at there speaking and advocating on behalf of all of our people. Um, and of course, I've known um, Ani Rubina for, for the same time, uh, working very closely with her and also with her sister Zita, which a lot of the people probably would remember from an Culture Study Centre. So thank you very much to our speakers for being here. Um, for me, I um, also would like to acknowledge our traditional custodians of the land where we meet and gather on here today. And I pay my respects also to the elders past and those that are present here with us and our future leaders based around the university here as well. So thank you, Jane, also for your beautiful welcome. And thank you, Joni, also for everything that you've done to be able to bring us here today. The, um, for me, for my people on my mother's side, uh, Gubby Gubby Nation, and also my father's side is from Camilleroy country. So here with um, Uncle Bob. So I acknowledge each and every one of you in your presence here today. So thank you. Today we welcome Ani Rubina, um, I remember Ani Rubina Row, Colby Anderson, a Gorang Gorang woman, and it's a conversation with Camilla Roy elder, Uncle Bob Weatherall, to share Uncle Bob's heartfelt account of the long battle to bringing home ancestors and raising the awareness of the history and the healing of Indigenous people and the stealing that took place of our mob. This is um, a very emotional event here today. So, yeah, so, so thank you. I'm yeah, very touched by all of this. Uncle Bob Weatherall's heartfelt account for such a long battle of bringing home our ancestors and raising the awareness of the history of the stealing of Indigenous peoples and relations that have gone on since contact with Europeans. Uncle Bob has dedicated his life to returning of the ancestors back to its ancient land and people who were traded across the globe and boxed up as objects in museums and returning them back to their rightful country. Ani Rubina Roe Anderson is a Gorang Gorang woman and whose tribal lands encompasses the Port Curtis, the Coral Coast region of central Queensland, Gladstone to Bundaberg, and the west of the Great Dividing Range. Rubina has been a primary school teacher, a journalist, a broadcaster, and a news presenter on both radio and television. In 20, 2003, Rubina undertook a secondment to FERA, the Foundation of Aboriginal Islander Research Action, to undertake the repatriation of Indigenous remains and artefacts from Great Britain. Three major repatriations occurred over her eight-month period. Thank you, Ani Rubina, for joining with us here today. Uncle Bob, as we know, is a Camilla Roy person and a Nimba man born and raised on the Balcom River of St George in southwest Queensland. He is the second youngest of five boys and the eldest living member of his family. His father was a drover, a shearer, a ring, bake, a ring barker, and Bob and his brothers, they worked in the shearing sheds before moving to the regional centres of Toowoomba, where he attended college. A primary focus for Uncle Bob has been campaigning for Aboriginal rights of self-determination, 
human rights, land rights, cultural rights and cultural survival. Uncle Bob has been instrumental on the local, regional and national and international levels at all levels of government and museums, universities and collecting institutions, including the UK Working Group in formulating a policies to expedite the return of the Aboriginal ancestral human remains and cultural property to Aboriginal ownership, care and management. Uncle Bob was a CEO FERA, or FERA, that FERA stands for the Foundation of the Aboriginal Islander Research Action, from 1980 to 1994, and the coordinator of the National International Repatriation for FERA, 2002 to 2004. Since Uncle Bob's return to Brisbane in 2002, his main focus has been on the repatriation of Aboriginal ancestral remains and cultural property to the Aboriginal ownership, care and management. Uncle Bob has served on many national bodies, represented Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at the national and international forums, including the United Nations Working Group on Indigenous Peoples and on the drafting of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And he was also chair of the National Provisional Government from 1991 to 2015. Uncle Bob is also a musician and has been working in collaboration with a band halfway and internationally renowned performer, William Barton, to tell the story of his restless dream and to inspire the new generation to advocate for the rights of the dead. Please put your hands together now and warmly welcome Arnie Rabina and Uncle Bob as our special guest speakers for today. Thank you. Ravina, thank you for your lovely words. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Just, just before you begin, I have an apology also that I think that Uncle Bob would be uh, keen to know that Uncle Bob Anderson, who you worked with for such a long time with Vera, a Kondamuka person, was unable to be here today because only Kathy has COVID. And, but he sends his warmest regards and his apologies that he couldn't be here today. But he did work very closely with Uncle Bob on the repatriation also. And a warm welcome here to Archbishop Mark. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ravina. And thank you everyone for being here. I consider it an honour to be here and certainly to be talking to Uncle Bob. So I hope that I can I hope that I can elicit from him information that you perhaps already know and information that you may learn for the first time. Now my laptop's down so I've actually got printed words to read. <laughs> <laughs> and um, add to that I'd better put on my glasses. Before I start I would like to acknowledge the the traditional. No, Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Now, the gentlemen at the back and the ladies at the back, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. That's Great. Right. All right. So let's be loud, Ravina. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and what a lovely piece of land it is. Let you think about that for a little while. And is that important? I shall continue. Uncle Bob, Uncle Bob, yeah. I'm honoured to be here with you, so let's get this on the road. Pleasure. Mm. Now, some 34 years ago, 1990, with the support of the National Coalition of Aboriginal Organisations, you, along with Tasmanian man, Michael Mansell, launched a seven-day intensive international media campaign to bring attention to the issue of repatriation of Indigenous 
human remains and cultural property. You both appeared on a documentary on the repatriation of Aboriginal human ancestral remains. It was produced by the national BBC program, The Heart of the Matter. Its televised viewing was seen by millions and certainly worldwide. You also appeared on The Third Eye in Ireland, their national program. So after all of that, my question to you, will you tell us more about that? <laughs> about what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to give recognition to the traditional owners of the land, first and foremost. Yuggera Jugger and um, Terrible, Gubby Gubby, Waka Waka. No, I don't know what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did I get there to do that? I think the beginning of it was when a young man called Wayne Atkinson, who was down in the South Australian Museum, um, just trying to learn the ropes and what have you, he came across um, a dungeon um, down in the bowels of uh, the South Australian Museum and um, he found ancestral remains there. Then they kept finding more. And so that got out to everybody and the Federation of Lands Councils around that time was all the Lands Councils around Australia. And that's when we had a good voice. But it was those people who basically started deliberating about what needed to be done in the taking of all the secret sacred objects and the ancestral remains and to find out which institution held what and how many. Then we had to look at the laws and to see if they had an ability to repatriate or to change their policy. The Australian government came kicking. All the Australian museums and um, universities did the same thing, trying to claim custodianship of our ancestral remains and <coughs> cultural properties but they used them just like they were the trades, you know, the tools of the trade. And that's how Aboriginal people were being treated at that stage, and still is. Kept in cardboard boxes and plastic bags and other dungeons. We thought that was pretty barbaric about what was going on and nobody else knew about it except us. But there had been an enormous amount of involvement by government in the practice of going out and getting specimens of Aborigines, whether it was skin, fingernails, hair, skulls, body parts, all of those things we have happened to find in Australian museums and also throughout Europe and the UK and the United States of America. Um, I know I missed that, but it was the BBC who heard of our story over here. And it was a problem over in England too, because the archaeologists and physical anthropologists were digging up their heritage too, and taking it, because they had already taken over 60,000. And so that's just their own people, that's for scientific experiments and study. Um, and the people were pretty um, cheesed off about that that their heritage was basically being disturbed and it was basically being decimated. But somehow they are still finding people from way back into the 16th centuries and what have you. And some of them are doing a good job, some of the anthropologists and the archaeologists and things like that, but there's a code of ethics that they really have to latch onto and follow when you're dealing with the rights of our dead. So, the, we made it a big issue in Australia 
forced the government to come and set up a, um, a working group made out of ATSIC under the Section 13 so that they could have an Aboriginal Repatriation Committee made up of all Aboriginal organisations, um, health services, legal service, childcare services, housing, education, everybody was contributing on that national level and at the, um, oh sorry, can't hear me. <laughs> um, and all the way through um, Noah and Rabina and the people that's joined the Christian faith in that, we had heaps of time to be with that and that every time that there was an event, all these things about Aboriginal rights were actually being talked about just like they were being talked about generally when we sit around the table and basically talk about what are we going to do to fix this up. So it was the BBC who took us over, over there for two weeks. They flew us over and looked after us and so that we could tell our story. So, yes, we then appeared on um, part of the matter. It was, it, was, it was needed to basically bring back um, or, or to bring about some kind of understanding in England. And here we were and we had a photographer, Penny Tweety, following us as well and taking photographs and recording that history about what we were doing and um, trying to get to the head um, people in museums and those sorts of things. Well, that was the beginning of um, what BBC did because they had already connections within there. They allowed us then to go and start talking to those people besides the it's always customary to go to the Australian Embassy and have to say hello and have a cup of tea, but don't expect too much. <laughs> Uncle Bob, you and Michael Mansell both gave us one of the first three, actually, international repatriation of human ancestral remains as a result of that uh, sponsorship by the, the BBC to do those programs. And um, I understand student pressure helped maintain the uh, pressure with other repatriations returnings from the Edinburgh Uni Medical School in 1991, because mm. once you had gone, they kept up the pressure on those institutions mm. and kept reminding them of what they had, Uncle Bob. So it was great to see that sort of thing happen. Question. Mm. Collecting institutions in Australia were opposed to returning remains at that time. Question. What pressures were brought to bear from overseas museums about Australia's poor track record? Yes, well, I'm um, sorry. Um, Australia's track record in any sort of development in regards to cultural heritage, arts and all that thing has always been dismal and real no commitment, basically, as far as I'm concerned, in basically trying to build a culture of a nation. There's somebody missing, some stories missing. People have got misinformation or misinformed and those sorts of things. And I think that it's time that through the reconciliation process that these things get started to get talk, talked about. And then I think we under, come to understand the underlying issues that we have with each other, even just over the rights of the dead. And that's what the most important part is, it? that it's all about, really, is laying the ancestors to rest mm -hmm. in accordance to their own traditions, really. Uncle Bob, I started by saying 34 years ago, 1990. That was very late in the space of time of occupation of non-Indigenous people on this land. Why do you feel or think it took so long? Um, well, we were waiting for a few white fellas to become our friends <laughs> who would whisper messages to us about certain other pastoralists or cockies or developers and that sort of thing. Someone would always tell us that something was happening somewhere in the country or we'd know it ourselves. So, um, 
I don't know where I was going. Um, time, time goes by. Well, I don't know where I was there at all, so mm -hmm. you just have to forgive me on that. I can sort of drop out communications as I go. Uncle, a national task force on the return of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural property to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ownership was established. Yeah. It tabled national principles for the return of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural property. The principles were adopted by all state and territory governments. Now, Uncle Bob, question, how was this the mm. development received by Indigenous mobs? Well, we had already been running a campaign for the removal of the Act. Everybody knows about the Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders Acts that basically took away all Aboriginal basic human rights and fundamental freedoms. And through our work at FERA, FERA had already, um, with the Aboriginal Legal Service, commenced a research program on going up onto Aboriginal communities and asking the question is, what do you want after the Act is gone? So they called it Beyond the Act and they went up and did the study and found out what people wanted in regards to um, ownership and control, management of the reserve. There was about 95% who wanted to have absolute control of their own community and governance. The next one was the church and then the next one was the um, Queensland government. So the Aboriginal people were basically showing their um, non-support for the Queensland government and their policies and legislations and the management of them under that act. Michael Ball, the guiding principles called for recognition of Aboriginal ownership of Aboriginal ancestral remains and cultural property called for preeminent role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in repatriation and repatriation be given a high priority. Now we're going back some years. How do you think those three points have progressed? Those points are, oh sorry, those points are principles in which we'd be basically identifying that um, were the main points of basically looking at the repatriation as of the long-term care and management of our cultural materials, ancestral remains, those sorts of things. But um, you can't just repatriate an ancestral remain like museums think you can, you know, here's your, here's your bundle, take them home, shut up and bury it, and hear nothing else. Well, that's been going on for so long. and. Um, um, what was the other part of the question? Okay, it's the preeminent role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in repatriation. Well, people knew all about this. In um, most communities up around the Cape, York and places like that, they still remember the massacre from the Jardines and that up on the Cape. They remember the managers and what have you over decades that were married, managing their lives and basically preventing any advancement of going out and get a proper job, but you were basically then turned into a domestic servant or you were a slave um, out as a, a stockman, butcher or even a copper, but you weren't getting paid for it. You know, so when the black followers go up to the thing on the weekend to go and get, you know, a parcel, they get a blanket and some tobacco and some flour. But they would always be the offcuts or the fat and the bristle and what's left on the bone. So that's the type of life that I saw. I was told not to be able to do certain things like use the white man's toilets on Palm Island. And I was told to go down to the football grounds and I could go down there and have a gear leak. It's a tea. So that's the type of attitude that I found in 1980. And I'd just come back from um, doing a um, 
a documentary on Aborigines and education on Aboriginal communities with the state education and they've been all that. You will never get to see it because what Aborigines were doing was walking off the community and going down the river in the afternoon still and at night and, and trying to pass that all on to their kids. If they were out of court, they were always punished or there was repercussions on the rest of the family and things like that. But when it comes to the, the remains and that, and people started to ask the question about how did they get there? When they go over there? That's the type of questions people were asking at that time. And when we started to bring them home and says, oh, we've got this skull here. This is this old man, only his skull. He said, where's the rest of his body? In my place, when we took our ancestors home from the Queensland Museum, and they came from all around Australia and some from overseas, 42, I think it was, that we took home. It took us 30 years to try to get some land, 10 acres, to put 42 ancestors in a paddock, really. And all around it is pastoral leases and pastoral leases and agriculture and agriculture and agriculture. So we were very, really affected very early out in our area of trying to basically follow the command and the wishes of the elders who told us in 91, go get them, bring them home. And that's what we did for the last 30 years. In four years, we spent with the people on the ground in the regional tribes to sit down to find out what they wanted to do around the borderlines of where there would be other remains that we're not so sure of, that might not belong to Gumaroi or may not belong to Gungari or somebody. So we worked out a, an agreement between ourselves, between five other tribes. Uncle Bob, I, um, I take your words, I take your words and I, I'll reiterate them. The disciplines of archaeology, anatomy and physical anthropology have contributed to the oppression of Australia's Indigenous peoples through acts of cultural terrorism. And maybe I'm just asking you to speak more of what you've just said. And how do well, you think Well, there's been overseas? atrocities um, right across this country of um, massacre sites, um, the undeclared wars, Brisbane here, 50 years they undeclared war went on. You may remember or know of the Kilcoy Massacre. Yes. All in Kabi Kabi and all the while, while and those people up in those areas were basically affected. And then the missionaries come along and put them on a reserve and whatever else. Still under the control and trying to still change them and scrub off the black, but you can't do that. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's the horrors of living, I think, as a young boy, young man on a reserve or on a camping ground, because somebody's always your master, whether they live with you or not, but they live in your town and you know that that cop's not your friend. There's no way in the world that he understands where you come from and wants to be of be a good friend. I mean, none of these remains that would, were friends. They didn't know them. They didn't care for them. They particularly just wanted them for their scientific specific studies and to be put on the record that they carried out a pilot study <laughs> of assumptions and those sorts of things. So we've been fighting this genocide that has gone on for so long that other people in the community don't seem to be able to grasp that there was a war here and the war was all right across the country and we were bought and sold to scientists. We were dug up, grave robbed by snatch, 
and taken. Um, Rabina basically mentioned Michael Mansell. Well, Michael travelled with me, uh, and I travelled with him, of course, um, for many years, and doing the repatriation work and within Australia and putting together principles, policies, processes and procedures and all those sorts of things so that it was all going to be done in a um, maximum of dignity. How to do this, how to do that on behalf of somebody else or you bring them with them. You have to go and sit down for ages with people and find out exactly who's going to be doing what and what that kinship role you're going to play while you're with them people because you just joined that other family. Sorry for that. But in Aboriginal religious law, there'll never be any sphere of spiritual peace until our ancestors are returned to us and to our care and management. They believe that they were buried in the faith of their traditions and customs, belief systems, that they would uh, be given their customary last rites in accordance with their traditions. But anthropologists, archaeologists, and those sorts of people in the social science have breached that, right? And we now have a major problem. So Australia has to deal with it like it deals with any other war victim. It's no different. We still deserve the respect and the rights of the dead to be recognised and basically afforded to those people. They never left you a, a will, but we know what customs and we know what traditions are and we know how deep that is with inside us all. It's not just a black folk thing, everybody else has it as well. It might take some people a little bit longer just to really grasp the real essence of what the spirit of reconciliation really is. Uncle Bob, again, I reiterate, your words, in Aboriginal religious law, there will be no spiritual peace until the dead have been returned to the place of their birth and received their last rites in accordance with their traditions. Aboriginal people feel deeply obligated to their ancestors to both protect and defend those rights with respect to their remains and hence demand that institutions return all such remains to our communities for reburial. Uncle Bob, given repatriation, was to be given a high priority question. Does the element of scientific value continue to hold the strong influence that it once did? Um, they're always poking the kangaroo. <laughs> you know, like people poke the green dragon. <laughs> it's the same story that the interests of the social science people, whether it's archaeology, anthropology, well, all within those disciplines and anatomy departments, have enormous uh, interest in basically their interests. <laughs> because it's not in our interests. If they would have found how to help us to get land rights, it might have helped, but half of them worked for the mining company. So there you don't get a real clear picture about the connection that Aboriginal people had with their lands and their spirit countries and those sorts of places. And whenever the two powers sitting at the table, they always want an advisory committee. That's all we've ever been. And when we want to have the type of communications with the people to basically get um, them informed and to be able to work alongside us and to sit at those tables to find common ground. They're not here. They're not committed enough. I don't know if you don't pay them, or if you're not paying them enough, they don't come to the party, but it's like anything, I suppose, that when you're dealing with governments and those sorts of things, the horses always change and you always get a new rider. You know, so 
once that happens, you've got to go and do it again. <laughs> you know, it's educating and you just go over and over and over. It's the same old pattern of welfare, I suppose, from bureaucrats. And that's how far away it is from our right of self-determination. When you look at it in that sense and you ask the question, why don't Aboriginal people have ownership and control of their secret, sacred objects, their works of arts and design? And the question is, who created racism? It's a Steve Biko question from the ANC, but from the Black Consciousness Movement in South Africa. He asked the question in regards to heading towards the true humanity that we would have to ask the question first about who created racism? Was it God? Was it man? Once you start answering that question and you see there people are being left by the wayside and they're treated as of no concern, um, it's a major problem for us, I suppose. But we don't have that control, that ownership. We're always asking for the white man, please, please, please like churches and the land mass that you have, you are going to give us over here once. When I was negotiating back in the 80s, never come. And the border ring is still down the back, a ceremonial ring, and the sacred ring has been destroyed in the path. But they're there, and we know it. And we don't even come from this country. Uncle Bob. You have had an adult lifetime pursuing the return of our peoples. What did it mean to you and your family, I can't imagine how you would feel, to finally bring your own ancestral remains back? Yeah, that was um, uh, pretty, pretty humongous, actually, knowing that, you know, your ancestors basically said, go and do something. And, um, and it is and was a real go and do something. You know, you, there's no way in the world that you could fail that or not do it. And so it was filling their stories too of the past and what went on and what they knew. And they had to start telling their stories. And then they started telling us about massacre sites around the place and then burial trees and places like that. And, um, and you would hear different stories from different neighbours, tribes and stuff about, you know, remains getting dug up somewhere when development took place. Well, we've always said well, we need a veto when those sort of things uh, occur so that we try to protect what is our heritage as we try to protect built heritage of non-Aboriginal people. But if you knock down an Aboriginal site, it's gone. We know it's there, we know the spirit is there and everything else, but there's always somebody looking for coal or mine and mining oil and things like that, and that continues to unearth those things. At least they're not deliberately trading on the internet. I think the last one I saw was back in was 2004 when the government wanted me to go over to Michigan. There was a photo there before. And there was a bloke trying to sell them on the internet, on the uh, uh, YouTube, whatever you call that, mm. the thing. And um, so we got the government to use emergency declaration of the Australian law uh, to put a spanner in the works and then they got in touch with the Michigan Museum over there and they got involved and uh, found that young, that man that's living in Ann Arbor, um, university town there, and 
he had a collection that he had up on the web trying to sell them. And anyway, they got in touch and um, convinced him to bring the remains into the, in, into the museum and um, because we were coming to get them. And so he showed up there in this little red putt putt car and um, had the remains in the boot. Four remains there wrapped in a box. Another two over here, and I said, uh, he said to me, he said, that's yours there, um, that it was on the net. These ones over here, this one's my mother. You can have her too. I went to his house. It was bloody hell, I thought it was in that Hannibal Lecter's house. I mean, that's what it looked like with all the artifacts of other neighbours, tribes and everything else. He had his own museum and how he got those remains is that those, those remains came out of a, a Murray Bridge Cemetery in 85. She'd only been 20 years old. And how they got that remain was, uh, those remains was um, one of the boomerang collectors and uh, participated in these sort of festivals they give, uh, what do you call them, gifts to people. So he thought it would be good to give a gift of an Aboriginal skull. So, and that's what happened. And you know, his stories over and over and over and over like that. And anyway, we didn't bring his mother home. We just left the sorry sod. We left him there by himself and walked away and that was it. And we brought them home. Um, and old Henry was with me. Uh, Atkinson and also Uncle Toby, um, Bill Toby, mm. who's a past two, and um, Uncle um, uh, Bill Pryor? No. Monty. Monty Pryor. Yeah, all the way back. He, they travelled with me a couple of times. Larrikins, really Larrikins. You don't take them to London. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Bob. Yeah. How are we going for time? But I feel you are quite relaxed. Um, is it time to take some questions from the floor? Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> and then. do we have a roving mic? Thank you very much. So if you just want to introduce your name and. <laughs> My name is Douglas Jones. I'm from Star of the Sea and Cleveland and Rap Committee. Thank you very much, Bob and Ravina. Um, Bob, the question is, what is the current attitude of Australian museums and scientific, so-called scientific institutions to the return of remains since you have said that there are something like 10,000 still remaining <coughs> outstanding that have yet to be returned? So what is the attitude? Uh, is it conducive to the return? Thank you. There's a few problems in basically just picking up remains from the museum and taking them home because we have to find and justify that everybody is connected and those things need to be done before certain things happen. It depends on if it's a um, biological tissue, body parts, uteruses, children, and those sorts of things, penises, brains. They're all there in the barn. When we went, oh sorry, I need my wife beside me, of course. Um, when we went to Scotland to the Royal College of Surgeons, um, uh, it was to go over to pick up Shiny, which is the great great grandfather of Michael Menzel. When we got there, um, we stood out the front with the flag just protesting and it happened to be the day that Nelson Mandela was released from Robben Robin Island and all these Irish fellows come walking past and marching, thousands of them and they stopped and saying, look, hey, there's some black fellows, they're Aborigines from, some, from over in Australia, what are they doing? And so we gave them a spiel and they stayed there half the day with us protesting 
And um, there was a particular parliamentarian who had won the seat over there, the being a um, consulate, and came from out of Western Australia, Philip Rees, if you remember him. Yeah, he had a redneck. <laughs> anyway, he he rang us in the morning, rang Michael and said, listen, I can get the remains to you today if you'd like to come and get them. So we went in there the next day and Reese was the one who wanted to hand them over to us and Michael just said, you know, take off. It's not what the word, but it's one of those. And when we walked in the door, the door was closed. He was standing there and there was a white cloth over the boxes that he had there. And inside that piece of cloth was shiny, his great great grandfather, in balm. And I can still smell that smell today when I want to bring that smell back because he was burnt as well. So on that journey, we also got William Lanny. William Lanny, who was on the docks down in Tasmania, he died from an accident on the, on the wharf and before his body was even cold, he was given over to the butchers then and the scientists, the anatomists, straight away because there was a big demand for Aboriginal remains, especially skulls to study the origins of man and the intelligence of man, trying to put us on the lowest level of the, um, of the evolution ladder and what have you. That's why I asked that question, does people know, you know, who created racism? You're going to have to ask that question. And how does it come around to be a racist thing or a racist act to make it look like that it's not a racist act? So, anyway, you go ahead. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, did I answer your question? Because I didn't. <laughs> it was very interesting, but uh, yeah. I just, what, what is the general tenor? I mean, you've, you've identified the limitations of dealing with the yeah. remains, but is there a sufficient legislative framework in place that enables you to actually begin that or to continue that process? No, that's part of the problem in trying to get the Australian government to give us a world-class legislation that recognises Aboriginal people's ownership and control. They are a signature to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. They are also a signature to the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination in the Human Rights Act. But they've never ever really used it. To make sure that they have legislation that basically protects the heritage of a number of civilizations being Aborigines, and there doesn't seem to be enough concern to basically sit you down and review and then basically put something up that works. Or at least goes towards that. Um, but they like picking em eminent Aborigines. And it never gets to the bottom of the question. And it never really basically understands the underlying issues where I can spurt them out. But you really need to have the processes and your procedures right up to date at first and that starts in the community first and if you're not running with that community that community will pull you right out of it but our people are really really strong on the remains and the cultural properties because it was all taken they had laws to stop us from dancing and singing and all those things and and speaking language and they could get rid of us if they wanted to you know, you could always hear about Mount Isa with a hanging going on in the background or up in Dumaji or somewhere like that. That's not so far away. Thank you, Uncle Bob. Any other questions? Can you paraphrase what you just said about the problems with uh, getting stuff workable and uh, getting it out to people? 
Um, through uh, this uh, Look, we had a really good relationship, yeah, before in the 80s. You know, we had the social justice commissions, and then you had um, the Queensland bishops and those sort of people who were adopting particular stands at that stage. There was an enormous amount of research support in 1988 as well, I think, and um, I remember Auntie Jean and these ladies here, uh, almost with Murray Ministry, been around all that time with all their relatives and other families and cousins here, who were just our family. <laughs> um, they've been doing that for years and years and years. So we had student unions. They were more conscious in those days about them because Vietnam came before that and that was shocking for everybody as well and people just wanted peace and so that's where it arrived at in the end and the people won that but when it comes back to you know bringing back the ancestral remains i think they're still doing a very poor job on bringing back the beyond um vietnam vets who was still over in vietnam Yes, David Miller. I just wanted to know how our people remains was allowed out of the country to be in museums in the first place. Do you know about um, world agreements? Because that's where it starts with the national museums wanting and wanting and wanting and wanting and wanting anything you got will take it no matter whether you kill for it or somebody died for it that's what they do they're looters and they're collectors and they continue to do that without your knowledge and without your consent and that's what they did to us we didn't know those old people were gone until some old people went to those places when they do have rituals and things like that. But then we start finding pieces of legislation, pieces of people's writing from, say, Bowen. In Bowen there was, um, what's her name? Flora Wills. She told the story about her husband taking out an Aboriginal, um, took him out, shot him, dissected his arms and his legs from his body and that and put him in, a sat in his saddle bag, took it back down into the community. They were having a barbecue. So he stopped there and he deboned, took the meat out of, of the bones and he ate the flesh. And he tells about the story having whiskey at night, how awful he felt in the stomach. So that's what went on. There was a woman called the Angel of Black Death around Rockhampton, mm. who was commissioned by a king over in Austria, Germany, something like that, to come and get Aboriginal skins. And it was the pastoralists who, who named her that, and they kept on chasing her as well. And I think she might get deported. But coming back to that sort of thing, how did we get them out of the country, or how did they get them out of the country? Well, it was antiquities then, wasn't it? And we were only flora and fauna. You were allowed to shoot us. You were allowed to take us. We could be your slave and we could be your stockman as well. But they had ways of getting them out and like they still do, even though Australia has um, established um, uh, the return of cultural property and that sort of thing in the legislation. However, they are very weak in maintaining a position um, because the National Museums over the last 10, 15 years have been able to negotiate with world universities and governments 
to basically establish legislation within Australia um, called the uh, immunity immunity from seizure yeah immunity from seizure so if any of those museums throughout the world want to come over to Australia and we know that we got rights in Australia under the legislation then we would use that legislation as an, an emergency declaration to try and keep that heritage with us but um, we're not going. so um, with the legislation um, with the legislation you can't do it so does immunity keep them immune from yes so we can't make the claim now the claim that gary murray did on the audio of people in western victoria way um gary tried to get the emu paintings remember the bark paintings that were there and because um the government established immunity from seizure legislation the federal government fought against the Yorta Yorta people the victorian museum and the victorian government fought against them as well and they took them back home to England. Mm -hmm. And so that has to be changed. That's just ridiculous that they do that because that's not inside the spirit of repatriation even, you know, or to, mm. to even start telling these stories about that. You know, we, we, it's a dreadful piece of body of work that basically is supposed to give some guidance about repatriation and what have you on whatever level it is um but the, basically the government's not given it back to us to run our own control and manage and that's what we did as uh, aboriginal control aboriginal based organizations where the people themselves own the whole process the organization they are a part of it but there's too much of this accountability to governments and PTIs and whatever else and those sorts of things. They're worried about those things rather than whether we have sufficient funding and whatever else to go and do the work that we need to do. I mean, basically without any any kind of interference. Interference. I mean, we do want their support. Anybody's support, but we don't want you to interfere. In it. Um, Fiona Romanis from the St. Patrick's Parish in, um, in Bentley. Um, you've got a room full here of non-Indigenous advocates, allies, supporters. What can we do? What's the take-home message for us to do today to support? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how many people realise um, uh, the announcement by the um, the Premier, uh, the last one, the woman, who, um, <laughs> I, I don't get their names, but, um, yeah, and, and um, uh, promised about $400 million or something that they'd go into a treaty institute, that sort of thing, and part of that money, about probably another $2 million or something, would be going to the museums and galleries and those sorts of things for the cultural thing. So, but there's nowhere anywhere where it is an Aboriginal precinct run, owned, controlled. Nothing talking about legislation or anything like that to make it better or to make it better, that sort of thing. So, it, it seems to be that not enough people are knocking on, the, not knocking on their doors. You know, and I think if you've got an interest, you just go and pull them up and talk to them and say, what are you doing about it? You know, this is your place as well. You've got to live with us. You can tolerate it. But anyway, that's what's going to happen as the new ones come through and the new leadership will build. And um, they'll find other people that they're going to have to communicate. Yeah, sorry. Uh, probably got time for two more questions. Uh, Glenn Conroy, uh, we live in a terrible country, and thank you very much for the 
talks and information. It's been horrifyingly insightful for me. And I was wondering if you could tell us how recent it has been that where Aboriginal people were murdered and disemboweled and sent overseas. How recent are we talking about? Because in my mind, I'm thinking about criminal law here. Yeah, there should be charges. We well, could go straight to the Northern Territory now. Well, there was a killing there to a Mr. Walker. And you can see how the justice system is bending. Not for him, but for the policeman and for the police and to have all those sorts of connotations of what they do in their awards and things like that. Well, we know that. We'd even pinch their hats off on the coppers when we were kids and we were fighting in the street out in the bush. We still had to fight. Um, but what was that? Your question again? Uh, basically, I was asking, does the criminal law, as it stands now, have any retrospective application to these effect murders, which have happened of First Nations people and who were disemboweled for uh, museum purposes? Yeah. Well, I think the only one, there are massacres and massacres around, like my old creek, creek where I come from, that's Bumura, Kamuru, down in New South Wales. And I was mentioning that it was the Plunkett's. Um, I don't know if you know a journalist here, um, Mark Plunkett. Uh, he's also a QC, I think. And uh, it was his uncles who basically gave evidence against those who had killed Aboriginal people, Gamilaroi people, up in, um, uh, in that country. So there is laws but they're not strong enough. So CRA or Camalco, and you will see the continuation of Aboriginal sites being destroyed um, and those sorts of things by blowing up by mining companies and things like that. So there's an unbalanced playing ground when you don't have all the chips or some of the chips and there's nobody people in the, in, in the mining companies, archaeologists and anthropologists as well, and they have particular views and you've got to fight that view. And we're always being interpreted to ourselves anyway. The criminal law has a higher standard of proof which would make it difficult for you, beyond reasonable doubt, that person was murdered. You know? Yeah. Very difficult. Oh, it would be today in records and things like that, but I mean, we can't even get a proper sentence here and a proper hearing. You know how many Aboriginal people have died since the Royal Commission and Aboriginal deaths in custody? What has the government done? How many have they implemented? None. Same old story. But they can be convinced that basically put kids, you know, do an act to put kids away and looking for jails to do it. You're going to have to speak up, someone. Okay, probably time for one more question. Um, give me the chair, mate. Uh, give, give me, give me, have made, um, this public knowledge over the last 30 years. Is there a lot of organisations that have sort of gone underground and aren't disclosing that they've got um, mm -hmm. objects like this? Yeah. What can you do about that? Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of um, historical societies uh, around Australia and country towns and places like that, and they've got a lot of knowledge. <laughs> More knowledge than some of us black fellas, in some cases, because that's been passed on too, of their relationship with Aboriginal people working to stop them and people on the, on the stations as uh, domestic servants. Um, uh, Underground. Yeah, there was a place in Toowoomba, I was in Toowoomba and I knew about this when I was going to college up there, went to the Darwin Downs Institute of Advanced Education, and we had heard from other people in the community that they had remains in their little heritage, um, Queenslander sort of thing. And they, they had all of these 
um, breastplates as well, and chiringas, boomerangs, spears, and whatever else. Um, but that's what they were doing and telling their story from their point of view and everything like that. But we could never take them because the law didn't recognise our ownership of property. Any property. That's a stone which could be a ceremony of it because that cultural property became the property of the sovereign state, not ours. So the sovereign state would but probably win it every time. However, Mansell was successful in making a claim uh, in Tasmania's um, magistrate court to stop the museum scientists in the Natural Museum over in London to stop taking, carrying out the scientific experiments that they wanted to do. There were 17 of them. Um, they sent me over with uh, one of the others and we talked to Jeffrey Robinson and people like that. Anyway, uh, they were spending millions of dollars against us, the public institution. And we just got more publicity than that and they had to give, the, give it up because it's cost them far too much really. But we did win the case in the end. What Mansell did get was that um, right across Tasmania, you know, they had the right and above uh, all administrations, anything of ownership over and above anybody else to their ancestors and all their cultural material. So they set that precedent, but that precedent didn't spread that blanket over here. So somehow we'll have to drag that up. That might be a job for you. <laughs> and we're going to be needing crowd funding anyway for that sort of stuff, so we'd be begging. Um, can I just um, say thank you, Uncle Bob, and, and Rubina. I, I'd like to say that, you know, over the many years there with FERA and the work that you've both done, mm. um, when you've travelled overseas and you were able to collect the data of where our remains were, held in institutions, in museums, I mean, there was even research back through the Vatican. Um, I think that that data there that we have, that FERA, we still have that, um, yeah. FERA for Average Mild Research, um, that there will always be and remain the property mm. of, of FERA because the government actually tried taking yeah. us to court um, at that stage to be able to um, claim that data that our researchers, we had quite a few Aboriginal people going over there um, overseas working for us for a long time and trying to gather that data as to where the remains were and who held them in the institutions and what was the process on trying to get that back to be able to return that. Um, and I know that it comes at a cost yeah. to everybody. I remember being witness when the remains were returned back to Canberra uh -huh. and we were there and then to see the crates of where our people were being returned into, where our people were left mm -hmm. and then waiting for people to come to claim their ancestors. It's a huge process, you know, it's not a short, short process at all. It is emotionally draining. And, um, and I will be forever grateful for the work that everybody does on trying to return our ancestral remains back here to culture, to give to our culture here, and to give them their traditional burial rights that need to take place. And, um, and I value all the work. I know that, Rubina, when you went overseas, and you were Uncle Bob, and that you were being sized up, you might want to mention mm -hmm. about that. Huh? Can I have your microphone? Huh. Okay. I did go. To, I did go. I did go to several places, and I didn't think you could drive that far in England. But I went down to Exeter, and it was most interesting. And I caught a train to Oxford. And uh, when I talked to the gentleman there, the anthropologist, he had a visitor from South America. And um, she was a fellow um, anthropologist, and they looked at me, and she started to describe 
how my head would look as a skull. Hmm. Well, that's not the only one. Because <laughs> when we met with the uh, Natural History Museum, Peter Stringer was there, the director then of the collections of remains and cultural materials. And I think that's in the Bulletin 91 by Monaghan, David Monaghan is a journalist and wrote for the, um, the Bulletin. And the front cover had the Angel of Black Death on the top of it. But inside it was an interview that Major gave to them about Rob Stringer asking me to leave my skull and his skull when I'm gone for science. Because in the beginning, in the, in the future, there's going to be greater technology and they'll have greater experiments to do <laughs> to keep themselves in the bloody job. So, <laughs> you know, they're going to have to keep finding more black fellas and we're trying to find them and so hopefully we get them first and but there's 11,000 in Australia at the moment unprovinced to a community of origin and they need to go back to some country uh, and there's a big debate you've probably heard about a national keeping place a war memorial and all those sorts of things well, I think we've got to do away with museums about ancestral remains and things like that. There's only one place for them to go. And that's back to country where the spirit is and he's got to go back there. And we've got to take him back and we've got to give him his customary last rights and make sure that he's going to be able to rest for the rest of his life as, as, he, as he believed. That's what he'd do when he was going to die and be protected by his traditions. Must have got a rude awakening when he found a steel cap or something cutting through his brain. So, we didn't take them away, they didn't catch a boat or anything, buy a ticket, an aeroplane or anything like that. But we're still trying to get them all home and trying to make sure that our children carry on our customs and our traditions and belief systems. And I think that's going to come around because with a lot of the native title stuff and people are finding out a lot more information than what they had before and access to different types of documentations. And, and, and it may happen that some Aboriginal people will get some lands back and uh, will have enough to basically maybe uh, set up some little community venture and that sort of thing but you wouldn't be relying on government to back you because it's only going to be a discrete grant of just sixty thousand dollars it runs out then your project is gone too and there's no real commitment and that's what we need to see with government it's a, probably a re review of aboriginal affairs and that's what we've been always talking about and the voice could have done that in some way of going there, at least talking to ourselves in the regions of their leadership to find out to find out what those people are saying. We know what the people on the, you know, the eminent, uh, eminent Aborigines who are up with the ca cameras and everything like that, well that's fine. They've got a particular view that the people themselves like you want to know the ins and outs of Dutch bum or after that moment no, because they want them and we want them but they think that they have custody and that's what's got to be broken within the law that exists in australia at the moment okay thank you um, well, you you actually in your restless dream in the the video um i would strongly recommend everybody to go online and watch that Mm. It spoke about your personal journey of, you know, country, yeah. fellow men who were remains were handed to you in a potato sack. Mm. Should we say? Is there anything that you would like to share with people on that? Mm. Mm. 
What was it? On the restless stream. I suppose I was getting frustrated really about the campaign and where it was going and what the national leadership was doing and basically whether they were addressing these things and how much and were they up at the top of government basically sitting down and talking to them and trying to get some kind of a position where Aboriginal people had sufficient funds to run the program and to continue to carry out the research and keep developing the data. And um, uh, that's, what was your question again? Where it, it was in regards to returning one of your own countrymen oh, right. to the river. Well, that took us 30 years. My people, um, mothers and grandmothers and that, they were all there. And they sat down and basically said that they wanted those ancestors to be brought home from wherever they are and laid to rest. And they realised that they, all their land had been taken up by pastoral leases and everything else like that. But there was a little bit of uh, common ground there, common land that the council had. So we asked for eight, uh, 10 acres and we got that. And we brought back after 30 years of fighting for land and for trying to get the release of the remains and trying to get everybody informed and get everybody having a say about laying things to rest and how the ceremony works and uh, what they had to do. It took us over four years with everybody in the, in the region coming in the different tribes and making that and sitting down with the main group and basically identifying that. But that during that time, 30 years, a lot of people died. But a lot of old people, and we can't tell them that we brought them home. So that's where we are. Um, others are very interested in it these days. A lot of kids are joining the social science. And that's going to be a, uh, an interesting walk between barbed wire. So that's why our culture has to be taught to our kids and told what is the proper practice. <clears throat> and to keep making that and keep doing that. We are the oldest living culture in the world, we know that. But to us at home and on country and on the water, you don't know us and how happy we are and that sort of thing, can't pull ourselves away and those sorts of things. I mean, I think, you know, there's an enormous amount of work for the 11,000 and I'm very worried about how many times they would be prodded and pried by particular scientists going to try to help us find connections to family biologically or whatever, I'll be running DNA testing and whatever else. But we don't have a say to say no. No one's listening to us. So we have to keep, you know, kicking the whole tin down the road. And if you want to kick it with us, we'd appreciate it. Yeah. I think Thank you very much for your time and thank you for your presence today. And thank you to everyone else for being here today and thank you for adding your questions. Have a lovely time this afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation today. Um, really informative. And there's lots of ways that people here can get on board and support. Um, as you said before, that you know churches are a very large group of landholders around the country. But Queensland just does not have our own keeping place here for the Queensland remains that should be returned here, not still There's sitting about there. 800 unprovinced here in Queensland, yes. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Give me the opportunity to be able to keep doing it. That's the reason of the whole thing to do with the album. I got bored with the struggle or with the protests we were basically doing and it needed 
some kind of flood of information to be able to get people involved with it and trying to make the changes. So people have been good. Malcolm Turnbull was okay. Um, so was John Howard. He got my um, Blair to basically agree to the uh, putting a working group together and then expediting the remains. So we can say thanks to him. But he's got a few other things to catch up on. But anyway. Thank you anyway. I'd now like to invite Archbishop Mark Collins to provide a vote of thanks. Thank you. The Laurel Blow Speaker Series has always been an important moment in the life not only of the Archdiocese of Brisbane, but I would suggest in the life of the city of Brisbane and beyond. But I think in a moment like this, it's got an unusual kind of importance. And I mean in the post-referendum world. I think everyone in this room would agree that the result, the process and the result that it produced was appalling. Yes. And in many ways was Australia at its worst, yes. not its best. But it's not the end of the story. We all know that too. And something that I have said frequently and that I come to believe with deepening conviction is that at least on the part of the church, the church that I lead, which is the Catholic Church, it is time for a new kind of engagement with our Indigenous peoples. And that has to be a new kind of listening. And part of the newness in this listening is to believe that we can actually learn, we who are not Indigenous, can actually learn from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. In the past, I think it's just been assumed that they have to learn from us. There's nothing we could possibly learn from them. But even listening to Uncle Bob and Uncle Rabina here today, you can see how, how false that is because there was much to be learnt, at least for me and I think for you, by listening to what Bob had to say. Listening to Bob's words, it struck me that at the heart of all of this is a different understanding of the world and of the human being and of the relationship between the human being and the land. Western culture, particularly in the scientific world that the West has produced, has tended to commodify the world. The land becomes a commodity, and it's not that for Indigenous people. The human being also becomes a commodity, so that the remains of the dead are simply specimens. They're things. They're commodities. Now that is a hopelessly diminished view of the world and of the earth and of the human being within the world and on the earth. To listen to Indigenous voices like Uncle Bob is to hear voices that speak of something much bigger and more mysterious and in fact, which is strangely closer to the world of the Bible. So I come away from this moment of the Laurel Blow series, and I think this has been a very, very creative addition to an already distinguished series. But I come away with the sense that we have we who are not indigenous, and perhaps we who are the church, have a lot to learn about what the world is, what the earth is, and what the human being is. And if we can listen and learn at those vital points, 
that we might find to our surprise that it is our Indigenous brothers and sisters and only they who can teach us really what it means to be the Church of God in this land. So I would like to offer a most sincere and heartfelt thanks to you, Uncle Bob, you, Auntie Rubina, for what you have shared with us today and for all that you've done. It's an extraordinary story. Mm. I knew the headlines, but no more. I know more now. But I want to say thank you also to those who have made today possible. A thing like this doesn't just happen or fall from the sky. It has involved a lot of work to, uh, to make it happen. So I know Joni and, and Ravina, but there are many others who have been involved in organising this um, extraordinarily informative and I think creative addition to the Laurel Lowe series. Thank you to you all.